Oh, thank you so much. Uh, super excited to be here. Uh, my first time in Singapore, first time at Hack in the Box, and it's pretty awesome already. I think you are all in store for a really great conference in a few days. Um, but yeah, so the title of uh, my keynote, Insecurity is Eating the World. Uh, so this is kind of a riff on a very popular quote by Mark Andreessen from 2011, where he said, software is eating the world. And he spoke about the rise of technology, um, the growing force of companies like ride sharing, um, like communications platforms, so Uber, Lyft, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. And at that time, it wasn't as evident the major role that they would play in the world. But now today, like there's no need for me to start with a bunch of stats and uh, slides on how technology is part of our lives. I think we all know that. It's part of everything we do. It's part of the vehicles we drive, the planes we fly in. It's part of net medical devices. It controls our communications, our money, our health. It really is everywhere and ubiquitous, and that's only going to increase over time. But I think the next frontier of this is the reality that, well, insecurity is eating that world too. So software is the forefront, but unless we fix things, insecurity or the lack of security is flying right behind that. And that's a pretty scary thought when you consider that impact of technology. And I think you're going to hear some really interesting, deep technical talks over the next couple of days. And what I'm hoping to do is start at a little bit higher level and give you some overarching ideas to think about in terms of how this all comes together. How does security play back into technology, play back into our lives, and from my perspective, I've been in the field for you know almost 15 years, and I've seen a lot of different things, and I assume you have as well. I've been fortunate enough to experience the field of security from a practitioner angle, from being a uh, red hat or a, a red team penetration tester, focusing on both network layer, OS layer, application layer. Um, and I've also seen the other side of things from a defender. And if you've been in these two different roles, or if you're in one role looking at the other side, you probably know they're very different worlds. How we look at security from the person that's breaking into the system to the individual that's tasked with helping defend the company or prevent those vulnerabilities from ever coming into play uh, are very different concepts. And has anyone ever heard that phrase around security? Oh, it's just a simple matter of X. It's, it's so easy. Why don't you just do Y? Well, as you can imagine, from the defensive side of things, sure, that technical concept is very straightforward. But doing that at scale everywhere for all developers and shipping code constantly, that makes things uh, really challenging. And so I really got to see that in the two different realms from, uh, again, my time hands-on practitioner and then also leading security at companies like uh, Twitter and Mozilla. So we agree. Life is technology. Technology is life. Uh, there's no increasing force of technology. It's here. It's part of everything we do. But why is it that we have data breaches all the time? Why is security failing everywhere? And are we this special snowflake in technology with security, and we have to figure it out for ourselves for the first time? Or are there parallels in the world that we can look at to say, how did this take place? How did this roll out? And are there things we can learn from that? And so this here, this very grainy image at very large scale, um, is an old image from the 60s. And this is the USS Thresher, which was a submarine that was a top piece of technology at the time. Um, it was modern, it was fast, it dove deep, it was a nuclear-powered submarine, and it was hailed as the pinnacle of technology in terms of submarine, uh, submarines at the time. Uh, and it was known as the fastest and quietest submarine in the world. And in 1963, when it was going on one of its deep dive tests, its systems failed and it sunk. And it was one of the largest loss of life for a submarine uh, where all the members on board uh, were killed. And this was a pretty tragic event at the time, and it really caught the U.S. Navy off guard as they had already positioned themselves to build uh, 14 more of these ships, they've received approval, and this was the path that they were going to go on, this new piece of technology. And so after this happened, very rightfully so, there was a discussion of, well, how, how could this happen? How could this piece of modern technology have, uh, 
well, sunk, <laughs> what failed. And as they found, as they dove into things and did their analysis, there are a few different things that came into play from water spray on electronics to positioning of emergency equipment that couldn't be accessed. Um, but one item that really stood out in the investigation was the failure of the silver brazed joints. Now, I'm not a materials or construction expert by any means, um, but it's interesting to see how as they dove in, it was the structural integrity. It was one of those small pieces that was just supposed to hold together different parts of the ship, and that piece of material is what failed and what caused the issue. So after this, this actually led to the submarine safety program called SubSafe, and it was a quality assurance program that started uh, in the 60s. They built out certification in four different areas for submarines but between design, material, uh, fabrication, and testing. And as you'll see, there's parallels to what we're experiencing now where they went into supply chain and they said from point of construction of each piece, so when it is actually the metal is uh, molded, where did it come from? What are the ingredients? What's the sign-off? Tracing those things through the supply chain all the way to construction. And it included quality assurance, it included internal and external auditors, it included uh, keeping records of all the information. Um, and after the subsafe program was created, there was only one more submarine that was lost, and that one was actually not accredited by the subsafe program. Uh, so interesting, a lot of parallels that come to this to what we're seeing in today's world, where we're, again, internal and external auditors, quality assurance, testing, uh, requirements. Uh, so interesting parallels to draw to the world that we're seeing. And this was not by any means something that was specific to submarines. As you go across to other industries, you see similar paradigms. So this is a picture um, of how I got here from San Francisco. Uh, no, it was, uh, it was a wonderful 16 an hour, half hour flight. Uh, it would have been more entertaining if I was able to play badminton. Uh, in air, but this is what they were doing in the 20s as, popu as flight was becoming more popular. Uh, I believe this was referred to as barnstorming. Uh, it's the showboating of flight with different uh, acts. And what happened in this time period was, as you can expect, there were accidents. You know, who would have thought? Staying on an airplane, something might go wrong. Um, but as they were showing the popularity of flight. Uh, the pilots and the airlines themselves actually advocated for and lobbied the government to bring them regulation, which is, again, something that might seem a little counterintuitive. Who goes out there and says, hey, give us regulation and requirements? But they did that because they want to instill public confidence in the airline industry so that they would have more consumers uh, be confident in what's happening. And so in 1926, the Air Commerce Act passed in the U.S., and they had safety regulations on airplane flight. Uh, and this was also after a variety of accidents um, and plane crashes. And you see this happening in other parts of the world. This happened pretty similar in the uh, United Kingdom after a series of accidents, then they move into regulation. So if we look at these industries that need safety, that need public confidence, if we look at submarines, if we look at aircraft, we see that as the technology became more popular, there was the desire largely after accidents, but the desire to instill public confidence by passing regulations, ensuring that there is compliance and standards. So the question comes up then, do all industries fall into this path? I think if we look at something like the medical space, you can think of years ago, the massive amount of snake oil. Again, another term that's found its way into the security industry. And in every case, regulation and control closely followed to try and bring sanity to what was going on. So where are we with technology? Well, we're clearly in the part of standing in airplanes and flying around. We are the wild west of technology. We're building things like crazy. We're doing amazing things at the same time. But the news headlines every single day show that we're not getting it right. And this is what's challenging. Is the security industry destined to be heavily regulated in all places? And if we were, would that be good? I'd venture to say I, I don't think so. I, I think the technology is moving so much faster. There's so much more complexity that we can't boil it down to a simple set of checklists and regulations to actually enforce security. But we have to know that it's definitely coming. And 
What you will not see here because of my choice of light gray and dark gray is the Venn diagram of concentric circles, but showing that these three elements of compliance, security engineering, and as I say, business enabling approaches, they all overlap in different ways. And we see compliance coming into security already. You can think of PCI compliance for processing credit cards. You can think of HIPAA compliance for uh, health information. I assume everyone is well aware of GDPR and its impact on uh, user data. And they're all striving in that same direction that we have seen from history, which is when there is chaos, in comes regulations to try and bring sanity. But I caution us to remember that compliance is really just one piece of the puzzle. As you're building a system, whether you're testing it for security, whether you're designing it, whether you're doing threat modeling, you probably have quickly come to the same conclusion that I have, which is compliance does not equal security. It is the first step. It is one of the things you do. But if you just become compliant with the standard, be that the regulations, be that a NIST standard, you're missing a huge part of the overall story of security. And at the same time, if you make it compliant and you do what I will call here security engineering, all of the other elements to make that system secure, you still might not have built something that actually helps your business. And that is another element of security that we really need to start adopting, which is this business-centric mindset. Because if you build a system that is secure and compliant, but it doesn't do anything for the business, you have a very secure system for a company that is out of business. And that doesn't really help anyone either. So we need to remember that although we can expect compliance to come, let's not stop there. Let's work on making those compliance requirements as we interact um, with members of policy to make those helpful, um, but also go the continued distance because compliance alone will not be the answer. Now, one of the other things that I've become acutely aware of through consumer-facing companies and doing security at those companies uh, is something that might be controversial at first. People don't care about security, but that's only because of that next little part, which is it's expected. Uh, and this is something we really need to get over. It is amazing to us. We are all about security. We care about all the details. We care about showing people what's happening and showing them the value of what we're doing. But I hate to break to everyone, they actually don't care. They want us to do that, and they expect us to do that. And where you will become successful is making all of those things happen in a very seamless way where nobody even knows it. Like, I can't believe we can do this, and somehow it is both safe and secure at the same time. Uh, I personally believe that self-driving cars, they're definitely coming. Uh, living in San Francisco, I see them everywhere, and I see the companies everywhere. But I would venture to say that from a technology perspective, we could probably have people in autonomous drones flying them across the city, maybe before self-driving cars, because of all the different elements you have to think about. A self-driving car has to think about pedestrians and soccer balls going across the street, and if you've been in San Francisco, the bicyclists. But a self-driving, self-flying drone just has to take people up in the air, have a flight path, and drop them back off. So imagine if we could do that and people would just feel totally comfortable. Like, I can't believe people were able to do this and make it safe and secure and I never have to worry about anything. That's kind of the same element that we need to create with technology in all places. So this photo here is of a wooden roller coaster. It's called The Beast. And this is in a theme park in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, where I grew up. Uh, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mother's maiden name is Kennedy. First dog, Sparky. Go to town. No, I'm just kidding. So the first one is true. And this wooden roller coaster uh, won awards as being, uh, at one time, I believe, one of the fastest wooden roller coasters. And uh, as you can expect, a lot of fun. But it got me thinking again with this expectation of security, of safety, and how we position that to, to the public. And if you draw parallels between what we do with technology online and, say, a roller coaster... Can you imagine walking up to a roller coaster with your son or daughter and you've been waiting in line for 45 minutes, you've eaten your slushy, it's sufficiently hot outside and you finally make it to the front of the line and there's a little sign and it says, warning, the seventh wheel on the third car is operating at 50% capability. Do you want to ride? I don't know. 
<laughs> sure, I, I waited in line. My kid's going to lose their mind. What we've shown them is, hey, we've given you information. We've shown you the, the risk of proceeding. Would you like to go forward? And it's really a false choice. The user doesn't really understand what that is. Their goal is to ride the roller coaster, and they expect that it is safe. So they either ride or they don't ride. But this weird middle ground of, you can continue, but I warned you, is really not fair. And that's basically what we do on the internet. You can imagine for man in the middle warnings and SSL certificate errors, for the longest time we would just say, hey, something's horribly wrong, technical details. Do you want to go to your bank? Like, yeah, I loaded the browser. I want to go to my bank. That's, that's why I'm here. And so I think we're starting to shift. I mean, there's amazing people at, uh, at Firefox, at Chrome, and studying usability. And that's been a fantastic area um, of exploration because we are putting these users in really an unfair situation. Like, it's, it, is in, it is desired to be safe and secure. So make it so or make it not happen. And this is, again, we need to move along these lines. Make the reality exactly what it should be. Don't fall under the illusion that giving users choice is a fair choice because they don't have the capacity to understand that decision, nor do they even really want to. Now, as we're moving forward, educating customers of the reality of security is still an important element, almost as a forcing function to drive the manufacturers, the companies, to the proper space. Um, if anyone is following the reality of Internet of Things, which I imagine most of you are, you've probably seen some pretty concerning trends. The Mirai botnet of a few years ago brought together compromised IoT devices to launch denial of service attacks against un unsuspecting third parties. And when you think about the components of what broke down, you've got the manufacturers of the IoT device, you have the consumer of the IoT device, and then you have the poor third-party victims that are unrelated to the first two. Who is incentivized to fix the problem? The user of the IoT device is largely not impacted because the smart criminals don't impact the host. If you impact the host, then they clean the host, and then your foothold is destroyed. So every good botnet tries not to impact the host. The manufacturers of the IoT devices, well, the attack's not against them. Nobody's suing them. Why should they go and spend money to make them more secure? The consumers are still buying. And so this is where we get into this weird problem where we have a breakdown in the process. We have somebody suffering. We have attacks happening. Um, but there is no market incentive to fix the issue. Going back to the point before, this could be a strong position where we actually expect legislation to fix that problem. When the free market doesn't dictate a solution to safety and security, uh, that's where there's an opportunity for legislation, one of the few, perhaps, uh, opportunities. But these two organizations, Consumer Reports, Better Business, Bez Better Business Bureau, they are also bringing an interesting light to the table. Uh, especially with Consumer Reports and technology, they are starting to go into how do we analyze the security and privacy risks of different products on the market. Just like we, just like they tested vacuum cleaners and washing machines to talk about their efficacy and, to some degree, their safety. Um, this organization, if you're not familiar with a U.S.-based organization, um, has been around since the 30s, and it's a nonprofit that's focused on giving an unbiased product testing for consumers. And so you can see a future where, when you want to go and purchase your refrigerator, which is now Internet-enabled, um, the product merits of why that is, perhaps I'm not their target audience, but I don't need my fridge to tweet for me or whatever it is it does when it's internet connected. But some people will buy this, and we do need some method of holding the manufacturers accountable or having an incentive system that drives them to fixing security issues. And so the approaches that we are seeing developed by Consumer Reports could be one of those, uh, one of those directions. Now, as we continue to think about the role of security and how it interacts with humans, I think we've kind of reached a tipping point. For many years, the focus in security has been very academic. It's been how do we build this unbreakable crypto? And I understand that nothing is unbreakable, nothing is unhackable. But we've gone this deep, deep technical focus. And that's great, 
but it doesn't really help us if the users reject it. Just like before, if you have security controls and you put the company out of business, you're not really more secure, you're just unemployed. And you see these same kind of failures in what we've presented to users. And so here's just two examples, passwords and PGP. And I don't know, would anyone object to me saying that we haven't really won on either of these fronts? It's kind of a big ball of nastiness. So PGP, very secure technically, but does anybody use it regularly? No, and we're like the most technical people out there. Um, so that speaks to something. And passwords, I mean, oh my God, this is just, just a mess. Um, we jammed it into everyone's head about making strong passwords. And then we told them, make it unique, but don't ever write it down. Like, that just, that just doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, I mean, hopefully we're starting to move them towards things like password managers, but this is still so much inconvenience. Can you imagine if you walked up to your fancy self-driving car and you have to enter a 14-character random string from, like, your phone and, and then tap over here? Like, it's just not going to work. Technology is going to move forward. People are going to move forward, and that type of highly frictioned approach is not going to happen. Um, so what did we do after we said password fail, uh, passwords don't work? How do we strengthen authentication? What was the next control that we told everyone is the future? Two-factor, exactly. So two-factor. Great. It is academically more secure. Correct. Something you have, something you know. Um, maybe something you are. Uh, begs the question for something you are. What happens if that gets compromised? You know, do you change your fingerprints? Different conversation. So two-factor authentication. So the challenge here is, again, it's great if people use it. And so a couple studies that show adoption rates of two-factor, uh, less than 10% of Google accounts have two-factor authentication. A 2016 Dropbox report showed the adoption rates were less than 1%. Uh, I can speak from experience and conversations that in other large, widely adopted systems, you see maybe 3 4 5% adoption. But we're not by any means closing in on 50% um, or anything really meaningful. And so you have to ask yourself, this is a great step forward from an academic perspective, but have we actually delivered security to users around the world? And now what is the current conversation about two-factor? It's death to SMS, right? To SMS can be intercepted. It can be potentially hijacked by contacting the cell carrier and getting a SIM swap. Those things are very true. They can happen. But that doesn't mean they're happening to everyone. Uh, and so if you're a high-profile individual and you would be a targeted individual and your threat model involves that, that's true. You should be concerned about those things. But what happens if we switch away and you know we get out there with our pitchforks, which some people are, and they say, death to SMS two-factor, and the company removes SMS two-factor? What happens then? So then we've got... Authenticate uh, two two factor via the app on our phone or via YubiKey, very secure. Those are solid. But then we run into this other position where we are just leaving people behind because of the adoption rates that we saw before, which were already small. The number of people that have smartphones, by no means, is that ubiquitous. So we're thinking about things from a very narrow sample size, from a very self centered viewpoint. Like, we probably all have cell phones in this room. We're all highly technical. Therefore, everyone is that way, which, of course, is a fallacy. That's not true. So this is a U.S. statistic of cell phone adoption. And in 2018, you see smartphones are at 70%. So if we turn off SMS two-factor in the name of more secure security, we just leave these people in the dark. So now they have passwords and no two-factor. And is that the right trade-off? And this is just a US-centric view. This doesn't even hold up in the rest of the world. If your user base is worldwide, which in many of the cases where we think about security, it sure is, we're just leaving a part, millions, hundreds of millions of people that don't even have the ability to have the second factor. And so this really gets to this thinking that we need to adopt. We talk about threat modeling all the time, but we don't consider threat modeling as we rip out the pitchfork, pitchforks and lambast a company for only having SMS. 
And that's just one example. Two-factor is one piece of a larger puzzle. But it really is this, we have to adopt this one size does not fit all. We have to realize that the threat model varies dramatically. And when you have a large user base that is a diverse user base in terms of what their threats are, you have to go into that and realize the defaults matter. That is one thing that I certainly learned from my time at Mozilla. Even if you present people with a choice, the default option, it's like 90% of the time they go with the default. So the defaults of your system matter tremendously. And those need to set a good, solid playing field because if your defaults are wrong, then the masses will be compromised. But if your defaults are unusable, that's going to present another problem. And in addition to this, you need to think, not all users have that same threat model. So we need to give an opportunity for people to protect themselves in an easy way. But then we need to think about, all right, well, what about this high-profile individual? How do they go and adopt the greater security controls? With the realization that defaults rule the world, how do we get them in a position where they will have that stronger two-factor, for that example's sake? Um, because it's true. The, the attackers do call up the cell phone carriers. They do social engineer them. They do steal high-profile individuals' SIM card, do a SIM swap. They do password resets. They get the tokens. All those things are very true in targeted situations. And for the hundreds of millions of other people, their bad passwords, which they reuse across the web, results in a whole other set of problems. So we finally get people to use those strong passwords. They use them everywhere. Random site on the web gets compromised. The attackers take all those usernames and passwords. They use automation, and they try them against every top website. Um, and this was definitely a problem that we faced um, a few years ago, and I think I'm going to talk about it in just a few slides. But to this point of one size does not fit all, I am encouraged that we're starting to see transitions in the right direction in terms of looking at highly targeted groups such as journalists. Um, that's really where we can take all of our amazing security thought and say, how in the face of a somewhat determined adversary, governments that are surveilling their citizens, surveilling journalists, how do we give them security controls that matter to them? And so that's great as we go in and give them those options. And at the same time, as the point I've mentioned, how do we separate those two thought processes so that we can give the general public the right security controls for them? And so we're seeing some more progress in a few other ways. Google has just recently announced that they have a stronger security option for those of the highest targeted individuals. And as you read into this, this is by no means designed for everyone. This is moving to things like um, a YubiKey. It's disabling some of the normal um, reset flows if you lose devices. It has a situation where you could end up being locked out of everything if you do it incorrectly, but it's also very secure for people that are facing those very targeted situations. And if anybody is studying the broad user base and how to handle hundreds of millions of users that have flip phones and handle people that are highly targeted, Google is definitely in a good spot. So they're speaking to the direction that we need to go. Uh, and similarly, uh, for journalists, things like Secure Drop are being set up. And Instagram uh, just recently announced that for two-factor, you can either use text message or the Authenticator app, which is kind of that perfect middle ground that we're talking about. Let's give the broad users something that they can all use and is supported massively. And for people that want to take that next step, let them use the Authenticator app. Let them turn off the weaker one. Because just by adding the new layers of security, if we don't disable the lesser secure ones, of course, that's a, a fallback channel that could be used against you. So kind of broad points to take away here. As we're thinking about security as it is user-facing, it has to be interwoven. It has to be a part of an amazing and elegant user experience. And that's a really hard combination of things. There's a reason UX exists and there's usability experts. There's a reason there are security experts. And what I'm saying is we got to get them all at the table. Uh, and that's challenging because we know how hard it is to get anyone at the table anyways for security. And now I'm saying yet another group has to be bought on board. But I really think that the future of security will be well-defined by how, how user-friendly it is and how easy it is to use to the point where people, again, say, I can't believe you did this, and it's secure. 
And then we also have to remember, again, for user-facing, not all users and threat models are the same. So before we get out the pitchforks and before we go after a company or an individual, think about that. Like, did we give them the right set of tools? Did we make it easy for them to use? Is it the right set of security controls for that specific person and that type of uh, use case, that type of threat model? Not everyone is like us that is highly educated on security and technology and very ac acutely aware uh, to the threats out there. So what I want to do also is, is switch gears a little bit. So we've talked about how users interact with security. And I want to shift over and talk about how this thinking we should apply to protecting enterprises and protecting systems. And I'll posit that, again, academic security is great, but the next frontier of what matters to defending companies is going to be speed, scale, and autonomy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why. So back to the kicking bag of passwords. It really gives us lots of examples for all sorts of uh, topics. But this was from the summer of 2016. Um, Krebs on security. I'm assuming many of you have encountered this before, a great source of security information. Uh, he posted his story about password reuse, and I moments ago talked about this attack where you compromise site A, you get usernames and passwords, you use them across the web everywhere. So a breach of 500 million users over here could be a breach of maybe 1% of them reuse their username, email address, and password over here. So a breach of 1% of 500 million, a sizable number of compromised accounts. And so in the summer of 2016, it really became very apparent that no longer was a headline just a, ah, thank goodness it wasn't us when someone got breached. It was, what does that mean for our company? What does, how many of those users would reuse passwords? How would we know if that password attack is happening against us? And for those of you that have designed uh, password authentication for uh, applications, how would you know? Like We've traditionally talked about password attacks with a threat model of one targeted account, hundreds of passwords. That's easy. You lock the account, or you slow down the, the uh, password attempts, um, or you force a second factor, all of those different options. But how do you solve the problem of one password for one account, one password for a different account, distributed from a botnet, where all of those passwords are potentially valid because they were valid somewhere else? This presented a relatively large problem. At the time, I think we've been thinking about those threats, but it wasn't standard practice to have controls available for them. So a few things happened at that time. One, attackers went out there and said, hey, we've got a data dump of a breach. It's from Twitter, or it's from Netflix, or it's from whomever. And they actually did that for Twitter. Uh, we had to investigate, uh, and I made a statement, because some random hacking group said we have a bunch of breach credentials from Twitter. We hacked into their systems. Hey, reporters, here's a sample of our dump, yada, yada. Um, what we found when we looked into that was that was not anything related to Twitter. It was just a repackaged data dump from some other website. Now, so that's one thing, just instilling confidence in the world that, hey, we didn't get breached. That's not what happened. But the other part was, what do you do about that credential stuffing attack that was happening? And those types of attacks started to hit all of these different tech companies and banks, um, really, in the summer of 2016. And so what you started to see was companies taking precautionary action. So for Netflix, they said uh, they found people's email addresses and passwords in other data dumps, and as a precaution, reset their passwords when they found their matches. And you saw companies adopting different methods of doing this. Some would go out and scour the dark web, find these password data dumps, pre-test their own systems against them and do res um, resets. Some would put them into a cautionary queue of this person's email address has been compromised, but the password didn't match. But nonetheless, we all panicked to some degree and built custom internal systems to respond to the issue. And this issue of credential stuffing attacks is actually a pretty tremendously widespread issue. Um, so a company that I was briefly at a few years ago, Shape Security, they produce a credential spill report. And this is the second report 
But based on their analysis in 2017, they found that 80 to 90 percent of authentications against financial websites were actually from credential stuffing attacks. That is a tremendously high number. But the reality of this is, is this is happening everywhere. And it's another situation where we aren't going to solve the problem by going in there and having more human analysis. We have to build security systems that are fast and integrated uh, into the workflows of our existing systems. In 2017, there was a Google worm. Did this hit anyone here? This was also the summer? No, this was May. And this was interesting because we've seen worms move through systems in the past. We saw Code Red, oh my gosh, 15 years ago? Does that sound right? Ancient. This was the modern, the modern day worm. And this was a clever combination of phishing and taking advantage of technology and how it was set up. So basically you'd get the phishing email like you see in the bottom left, opening GDocs, and you would see what you would expect, a login prompt for Google where you'd click login. And what would happen was at that point you've authorized an application, a Google app, and that Google app had access to your email. It would go through your contacts, and it would send the same thing on to everyone else. It was largely benign. It didn't do anything malicious, but it did spread dramatically and took advantage of two things. One, phishing, and two, the similar user interface between authorizing and Google app that you would expect um, in the context that you think you're getting and the malicious one. And so this showed us a couple things. Uh, one, it showed us that the add-ons ecosystem is definitely ripe for taking advantage of, and you see that um, in the Google Marketplace, you see that in the Apple Store, you see that in add-ons for um, that you can integrate into Twitter, into Instagram, etc. Um, but it also showed how we again need to be thinking about speed. Now luckily in this situation, this spread so fast that it set off alarms everywhere, and Google was in a central position to go in there and just remove it. But imagine if something like this was a little more quiet, and instead of being a benign attack, just adding, going through your contact list and emailing them all the same worm, what if it also went into your documents and added collaborators onto random documents? Would you ever know? How would your incident response handle that? Would it be all hands on deck, let's look at this for weeks? And at that point, how much data has left your company? What is the emergency plan to turn off cloud services if you're using them? It really raised a lot of questions as we embark on new technology. What do we do when things go wrong? So it's a bit of a canary in the cold mine to show us these are things that we need to be thinking about. The other seminal example is poor, poor target. So it's been a few years. Um, but of course, we know they were breached. We know they paid millions of dollars in fines. And if you don't understand the history of how they were breached, um, it was actually through a third-party contractor, uh, the HVAC system, I believe. Uh, and so that original HVAC system was compromised by a phishing email. They got into their credentials, and then they pivoted into Target, used that access through HVAC, and as a third party found that they basically had full network visibility, so they weren't locked down to one system, used that to then compromise systems that let them push updates to the credit card systems, which let them steal data. The thing about this is Target wasn't, I would say, negligent on thinking about security, but security was unfortunately negligent on being effective. So they had a SIM, they had logs, they had alerts, they had the data in their logging systems of these anomalies. But what does that get us? And not to pick on target here, it's just an example, but how many times do we have logs inside of SIMs that say, oh yeah, you, you were compromised six months ago? Like, great. Is that what we're doing in security? Are we building logging systems to confirm when the Department of Justice says you were compromised? Like, oh yeah, yeah, that, you're right. We were. Cool. Uh, so while SIMs are the go-to product in big companies to aggregate security of events, 
it's still kind of a losing battle. And I, more than kind of, I think it's a failed approach. And I th- I th- the main takeaway that I really want to get from these breaches, from what we're seeing with fast-moving worms, from what we're seeing with password attacks, is that the concept of bolt-on security, it's not state-of-the-art, no matter what marketing brochures say. And I would posit that it's not even relevant any longer. Just having a history of how you were breached for when someone comes and tells you you were breached isn't doing us any good. So not to be Debbie Downer of technology, all is not lost. Technology is a wonderful thing. Like all other places, we will persevere. But the question really is, is how? Where do we go from here? And looking to the future, I think the biggest thing we can do is recognize the failures that we've had and realize that they were well-intended. We had smart people thinking about problems at that time, and the problems have shifted. The landscape has shifted, and we need to take those same smart people and, and more new smart people and think about it differently. So I think if we continue down the path of the old model, if we build big firewalls, if we build big sims, if we aggregate all the events, and then we have humans parse through it all, no matter how smart those humans are, no matter how many we hire, that's not going to work. We need to shift to a different thinking on that. Now, the people that we're working with, like I said before, they expect security. So we need to make sure that we provide the right security for their particular threat model. So they're getting what they need and not something that doesn't work uh, for them or is insufficient for their needs because they are a highly targeted individual. As I briefly mentioned, I really think the defining thing that will help consumer-facing security and even business-facing security when you're thinking about individuals outside of the security team is usability. Make your tools elegant. Make them so easy to use that you don't have to be a security expert. People in IT care about security, but they're not going to go become security experts. People inside software engineering care about security, but they have all these other competing priorities. So make security as easy as possible. Make it the default flow that you have to go out of your way to do something different that's much harder uh, to not be secure. And when we think about where SIMs are failing, where log analysis is failing, Let's move away from having a bunch of events come into a system and humans look at it, and let's move to the spot where how many of these events, how can we cut this? Let's take the top 5%. How can we cut this and have the systems handle them end to end? And I think that's really where the exciting challenges are. How do you start piecing off parts of that stack of events that happen that you care about and say, oh, we saw this event, we have high confidence because of these signals, and we handled that event automatically. The person that came in through the HVAC connection, it shouldn't have access to other systems. Once they started to move to other ones, we cut down that connection. It would be great if you locked that down to begin with, but you should be able to define things that when there are deviations, you handle them gracefully and automatically. Because we need to move towards the speed of computers. We've operated in the space before operating at the speed of humans. How fast can the security team analyze this malware and come up with the decision? How fast can we analyze these phishing attacks and then as humans go out and educate and try and pull things back? But we don't, we don't need to do that. We have to move at the speed of computers because that's the attacks that we're facing. So if we're moving at the speed of computers, the question also comes up of what are we doing as humans? Are we trying to automate ourselves out of jobs? Well, yes, you should always aspire to that because you will never accomplish it. Instead, you will just be wildly successful. So automate away. But security professionals, I think we need to move this mindset to, we bring security expertise to think about the threat model, to think about the moving parts, and think about the solutions that we need to do. We build that knowledge into software. We tune it, we correct it, we give it data sets, we design that. And those pieces of software are autonomous security defense systems. That's where I think the the future is. We've got to build systems that take a part of this puzzle and keep cutting it down by by using automation and solving issues from end to end. Otherwise, we'll just be a bunch of humans running around with our heads cut off, finding out from our systems that we were breached months ago, and wondering, why isn't this working? And so to end with a relevant quote, 
from George San Santayana. Those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I think that's particularly apt for us in security. So I challenge everyone as you go through these next days, think differently. How can we move towards autonomy and speed and scale of our defensive systems so that we don't keep failing? That's all I had. Uh, I appreciate your time. And if you have any questions, I will be outside. Also, feel free to contact me here. Love to talk more. Thank you.